Now is it working? Okay. Apparently you have to hold the button for a little longer. Uh, I'm Andrea Furston. I'm the Director of Education and Jobs here at United Way. And thank you all for making the time to be here today. This is our annual report training um, for those of you who just want to make sure you're in the right room today. And just one, um, one piece of information for those of you in the room, our bathrooms are right behind this wall. Um, for those of you on the webinar, thank you for joining um, via that vehicle as well. I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, grounding in what we're going to cover today, and then just a little bit of context on our process, and then I'm going to hand it over um, to the managers who are going to go into a little bit more detail about some of the guidelines and um, tips to the Semaine Equality Report. And then uh, Tom will, will provide a refresh of just a uh, online training system and what that really looks like so you know what to expect. And then for those of you who are in the room, you'll have a chance to, uh, to uh, break out with the manager of your, the program goal area that you're in and just ask um, other questions, get maybe a little bit greater clarity. For those of you who are participating via the webinar, feel free to submit questions via, uh, is it our online, the chat room, um, and we'll either answer questions via that vehicle um, by typing responses, or we'll, we'll announce those questions uh, out loud to the group and then answer them that way. If we don't have a chance to get to your questions, um, this is for those of you on the webinar, know that we will respond to you um, after we're done here today, so uh, we'll get back to you. So, so you may wonder, like, why do we do this and really um, why now? So I'm going to start with the why now. Um, last year, really, the team tried a new approach of doing this annual reporting during the summer and really trying some, really adding on some new questions and really rethinking this process a little bit. And what we got was really positive feedback and quality reports. So we thought, why break what works? And so we're continuing sort of with this process. Did I get that right, team? Okay. Um, and so in terms of why we do annual reports, just so you don't feel like, why do they make us jump through this hoop? We just wanted, to, for those of you particularly who are new to this, to just get a little bit of context about how we use this information. So the reports capture important information updates about your program. It really tells us sort of what's working, where are the challenges, how the environment has changed. We recognize that a year can be a long time in a pretty dynamic environment. And so we're really learning from you, the experts on the ground, around how things are changing and how you're adapting and where some of the challenges are. The data you provide allows us to understand the progress you're making towards goal. Um, we want to understand, and we also need to be accountable to our donors. And, and in turn, it's really a partnership. So this allows us to really measure what's working, the kinds of results that we're seeing, and share that collectively with the community and ultimately help bring in dollars to support this important work that you're all doing. We also, as I mentioned, want to understand the successes and challenges. This helps inform us around what role can we play, how can we um, really educate folks around how the, the environment's changing, how can we work in partnership with you to really look at it and address some of those challenges potentially. And then we use this information to communicate with a wide array of internal and external United Way stakeholders. So some of this may be our committee members. Some of this may be donors out in the, in the community. We may talk about this in terms of our workplace campaigns where we go out to companies and really educate donors on, here's what we're seeing in terms of challenges in early learning or in out of school time or in, um, in reading by third grade, the literacy area. And here's how you can partner and help in that. It's really your stories that help inform our communication and our education in the community. So thank you for that. Um, this data also informs us, informs us of the emerging themes and best practices and provides opportunities for continuous improvement. So really, you know what works. You help educate us and really inform us around what are those best practices. So for instance, now as we've rolled out this concept paper, and we'll be you know, rolling out our um, request for proposals, this really helps us inform us around sort of what's working on the ground, where do we get the best results, and how do we support that quality. Um, so no, basically the message here is we use what you tell us in, in many different ways. 
So here's our timeline. Uh, we're already at uh, making the annual reports available online. Um, now we're doing the trainings. We have two of them. And then the annual reports, this is the real important part, are due on September 30th by 4 p.m. Um, so please mark that on your calendars. We always recommend trying to you know, get a little bit ahead of the game on that just in case there are some difficulties with technology, um, weird things do happen. Um, and then on, in October, we'll be reporting, um, we'll, we'll be reviewing this, uh, and then managers will reach out to you if there are any sort of clarification questions or concerns. They'll reach out to you and begin um, having those conversations just to make sure that we understand what we received, and if there are concerns, that we'll be just beginning to dialogue um, with you around that. Uh, and then uh, we'll be making revisions based on what we learn and how those conversations go all within the month of October. So now I want to introduce, although I'm sure you know most of the folks, our amazing education team. Um, we have Naomi in the room right here um, who works in our early learning area. Um, we've got Barty who's in the back there um, in our reading by third grade area. And then in our out of school time area, we have Rachel. Here she is. <laughs> uh, and then on operations, we don't have Katie in the room, but know that Katie is an instrumental part of our operations team. And, um, and on sort of Katie's team is Sarah in back. I'm going to jump to Sarah, um, who is instrumental in really helping to make sure these processes move smoothly, as is Melanie, who's right to the left of Sarah, for those of you who are in the room. Um, and then IT, you'll be hearing from Tom. He really is critical in terms of this online process and making sure that this goes smoothly for all of you and is streamlined. So my last piece is just saying um, that uh, you'll be submitting the annual report. In terms of the time frame and the data, we often get questions because the work um, in the education field can be a little bit tricky in terms of timing. Ultimately, what we say is do what works for you. So if you're thinking about do I, if I do summer programming, do I report on this year or do I report on last year? And what we say, and correct me team if I get this wrong, is that be consistent. So if last year you reported on 2012, then this year you want to be reporting on 2013. If last year you told the 2013 story, then this year you should be telling the 2014 story. So we don't want to be overly prescriptive on sort of here, here are the dates you need to cover, but rather um, making sure that you're consistent and, and that we're not really looking at duplicate information there year to year. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it over to Naomi, who's going to take it from here. Hello, everyone. I'm going to stand up here because otherwise my legs might do a little dance if I don't get grounded. Um, can everyone hear me as we went through that transition? OK, let's speak up so that our webinar friends can hear us. So um, Rachel Oberghausen and, Oberghauser and I are going to walk you through what we're looking for in terms of content with the annual reports. Quickly, by a show of hands for the folks in the room, how many of you went to the annual reports training last year? Great, so about almost half. A lot of the information Rachel and I are going to go through are going to sound pretty much the same as last year. Um, that's not to say you won't get something out of it, but I do just want to let you know this is going to be repetitive. For those of you who won't, we hope that this is going to help you understand what we're looking for in the annual reports. So um, again, for those of you who went through this process last year, there is a slight difference, and the difference is that it's shorter. Um, as you go into the system this year, you will notice, if you filled this out in the past, that we've omitted pretty much the majority of the narrative questions that would come after the outcome indicators. And the reason for that truncation of the report is because we want to be respectful of your time and recognize that many, if not most of you, are going to be responding to our education RFP this fall. So while we are not asking these narrative questions within this annual report, we do expect that you're going to be thinking about those same questions as you prepare and respond to our request for proposals. Hope that for the purpose of this annual report, it will alleviate some of the work um, in terms of that element. 
The other thing is, and this only applies to our grantees within reading by third grade, is that we added one additional question. And Barty Wahi, the senior program manager for reading by third grade, will spend time um, after we go through this training to talk with grantees who have questions about that. And for those of you on the webinar, Barty will be happy to talk with you um, through that question offline. So that's about it. I hope you're excited about the fact that there are not as many narrative questions, but I do just want to give one caveat, and that's that those narrative questions will likely come back in some format in the future. Um, as Andrea articulated, we really do learn so much from what you guys report every year, um, and we use that information in a variety of ways. So while we're excited that we can you know, reduce the amount of work that's going to happen this year, we're losing some information this current year, and that's why we just wanted to say they will likely come back in some format next year. Um, so, oops. now we're going to jump right into uh, question by question what we're going to be looking for in the annual report. So, everyone should have in front of them, if you're in the room, and I'm hoping the same goes for those folks in the webinar, I'm looking at the document that's titled Completing United Way Annual Reports Education. It has our logo on the right and um, a section at the top that says key. I'm giving these instructions for our webinar folks here. So this document really is a step-by-step -step process um, of what, again, we're looking for in the annual reports, and we hope that you find this useful. Um, you can always come back to it as you're going through the um, completion process, and if you have any questions, again, always feel free to contact any one of your program managers. So just quickly in terms of the key, um, and it's really pretty much anything that's orange, those are kind of call-outs that highlight the question we're talking about and then the um, explanations that we provide. So as we go through this, the first thing that I wanted to um, point out is please provide a descriptive name for your report. Please try and make it succinct and link it back to either your organization and or your program to help us. Um, this is not a critical data point, but it's a quick reference for us as we're looking through spreadsheets of data on all of our programs. The next question is select the name of your grant program. This is going to show up in the system as a drop-down option, um, and every uh, grant program within our portfolio for each goal area is going to be listed. It is critical that you correctly highlight your program and make sure that you then click outside of the drop-down box. What we've noticed in the past is that someone will um, depress or click on their name and then use their scroll bar or their mouse to go to the next question. And what happens then is that often another program's name gets highlighted. And then what that means for us on the back end is that your data and all the information you provide in the system then gets uh, allocated or assigned to the program that you selected. There are ways for us to correct it, but unless we know what's going on in advance, we're often having to do detective work. So what I'm asking you to do um, kindly is to just make sure that your correct program is highlighted as you go through this question. So I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, and this was one of the new additions for last year. We just asked for your elevator speech for your program. Uh, keep it brief, but please do describe in a few sentences what the funded program is intended to do and how it does that. The purpose, again, for this paragraph is it kind of sets and frames for the program manager who's reviewing your annual report what it is to do. Because so many times we're reviewing 30 plus annual reports, um, it's always helpful to get that quick reminder. So we greatly appreciate your input there. The second question, before we get into the meat of the annual reports in terms of the numbers, is how, if at all, has your program changed over the last year? This question is also really helpful for us to understand why, if at all, your performance numbers that we'll then get to next have changed at all. And it also helps us just keep better attuned to the changes that your program has experienced. So we encourage you to, if there are any significant program changes um, made, we encourage you to articulate that there. So although I'm not going to go into the program-specific indicators for each goal area, and that, again, is something that we're going to pick up after Tom um, does his IT piece, I did just want to give a few um, suggestions as to how to complete the program-specific indicators. 
So the first thing I would recommend as you start to fill out the numbers portion of the annual report to your um, that was created soon after you were approved um, for your for your grant. Um, if you changed uh, your program outcomes through the change indicator form, that would be the more recent document that you use. And either of those documents are things that you can find on your grant subsite. If you've never been to your grant subsite, Tom can advise you on how to access that at some later point. But I would suggest that that's the first step for any um, program to do as you start to tackle this report. Specifically, what you're looking for is what are the annual program targets you set for each individual indicator. And that would be an actual raw number, so the number counts of people who should have achieved whatever indicator it is that you're looking at. Are there any questions about this document, the two documents I'm referencing? OK. I know we have some new folks in here. So if, if I'm moving too fast or you have no idea what I'm talking about, please do ask questions or get one of us afterwards. So as you're completing the indicator form section and you're indicating how many people um, actually met each of the indicators, what we want you to then look at is, is there any variance compared to what we had targeted for that indicator? And that's why I'm asking you to reference your funding agreement or the change indicator request. Where there are, are differences in um, your targets versus your actual, we really encourage you to use the narrative section under each indicator to articulate why there's um, outperformance or underperformance. Be proactive and help un us understand how you're doing so well or where there have been challenges. Because we're not asking this year those narrative questions around successes, challenges, and emerging trends, this is exactly the place for you to articulate what has happened to get to those numbers where there are big changes. And where there aren't changes, where you've hit them straight on, Feel free to give us more story around those numbers. We've heard in the strategy refresh that folks want to be able to provide story to the numbers. Those are the areas where you can do it, and we do encourage you to use it. So going back to the narrative pieces, the one narrative question that survived this uh, round of annual reports is the uh, participant success story. And this is the same. Um, wording that we used in last year's annual report. We're asking each program to share with us a client-specific success story. Um, and there are a number of things that we shared last year uh, around tie the story to an individual, not an aggregate story. Um, be specific around the transformation that happened for this person and try and connect the head and the heart in the story. There's got to be some kind of uniform story that we can follow that's not just about evoking emotions. Um, just by show of hands also, how many of you were able to go to the Lori L. Jacob with storytelling uh, session that we held in the spring? OK, a few. Um, good, helpful. Do you feel like the workshop is going to be helpful in filling out your, your story here? Good. Um, so I will just quickly share a few of the highlights that uh, Lori would have shared. And also just for those of you who didn't get to come, there's a very great likelihood that we're going to be able to host um, the exact same session at the end of this year. So if you were not able to attend in May, we strongly suggest that you pay attention when we do make that um, notification about the next workshop and invite you to participate. But one of the things that, sto that Lori would have said around storytelling is that you want to evoke emotions in people. You want to have that good head and heart balance. And that you need to think very um, creatively around uh, the story that you're trying to tell and make sure that you're articulating some kind of transformation and locate your program within that transformation. We don't just want to hear about how a person changed. We want to understand how your program contributed to that positive change. So there are four or three steps that she would suggest. And I already included those. We were kind of lucky in terms of our steps. Uh, one is you want to identify one person, and kind of, or it could be a family, and tie your work to that one person. Um, the second is you want to identify uh, the results that happened um, through your work. So for example, is it because of the coaching you provided around uh, career training that someone was able to get a job. And I'm going to use jobs for the purpose of um, this example. 
And then lastly, be able to connect the transformation in that person or family to the results that you were talking about. So you got them a job, that's great, but how has their life changed because of that job? So those are kind of the three um, big steps that Lori would suggest you think about as you um, compose that, that story. So I'm, before I hand over the microphone to Rachel, any questions so far about any of the items that I talked about or anything from the webinar? Excellent. Complete clarity. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, one thing I do want to add, too, um, is that for a number of these, there are examples, and these come from annual reports that have been submitted by all of you. Um, so we actually thought this particular success story was um, a really great great example, and so you'll see in the previous ones as well um, examples of um, really great responses and things to, to, whoops, I didn't mean to highlight that. So next we're going to move on to the fun stuff, I hope, um, budget. It's supposed to be a joke. i supposed to laugh at that. Um, so the first piece is just talking about your organizational budget. And so um, all we're asking for here is what your 2013 um, actual um, income was. And so this should hopefully be solidified by this point. Just asking you to insert that in there and then what are kind of the dates of your uh, fiscal year. Um, for the actual budget piece, we're just looking for your program budget. Um, and we just wanted to highlight a few things that we've noticed on previous um, budgets where um, we, we would have liked some more information. So on this first line here um, that says Greater Twin Cities United Way under the income piece, um, what we're looking for in these columns are your grant amount, um, just your grant amount. So this doesn't include um, any designations you might have received through United Way. Um, it just is your grant amount, okay? Um, and then that, the line below, um, says other United Ways. There are some of you that have a large service area where you might be receiving grants from, say, United Way of Olmstead County. Um, that's where you would include that grant if, if that contributes to your program. Otherwise, I think for the majority of you, you would probably just leave that blank. Um, you'll see here on the columns as well that the first column here is looking at your 2014, or excuse me, 2013-2014 actual. So this is what last year what you spent on your program. Um, and to Andrew's point, um, which you mentioned earlier, you know, we're not going to be super prescriptive on when that program budget starts and when it ends. Um, we just generally want what does it cost for one year for you to run this program. Um, so if, you're, if it's easier for you to calculate your program to start September 1, 2013 and go through August 2014, that's fine. Um, but just let us know in the comments later on kind of how you've um, defined that. Does that make sense what I'm, what I'm saying? Get some head nods? Okay, great. And if you have questions about that, again, please feel free to reach out. Um, and then the second column is going to be your 2014-2015 projected. So this is kind of what you're um, planning on spending in this next year upcoming. Um, as we scroll down, you'll see um, the other, um, which excludes in-kind piece, and some of what we're looking for there, um, the example that we have here is, you know, if you're, uh, for instance, a national affiliate, um, might sometimes give grants to the local affiliate, so this would be a place for you to put that in. And we just ask that if you do fill in the other category, um, that you just do label it so we just have an understanding um, of what's included in, in that area. So we're going to go to expenses, which is fairly straightforward. Um, and then you'll see, too, we have a text box, um, which so if there are things that um, you want to provide extra narrative around regarding your program budget, um, we'd ask that you include it here. And so some of, some of those items might include, um, you know, if you're a youth program, the youth bus broke down, so we had to buy a new youth bus, and that's why there is maybe an abnormally large um, expense um, in our program budget. So things like that that may have happened that will help tell the story of kind of what, what your, why your program budget is like it is. Does that make sense? Great. 
Um, again, more numbers. We're moving on to the program demographic data. So here we've kind of combined a lot of the columns here on one page. Um, so what we're looking for is the total number of individuals um, that you served, and then we're asking you to break that down by gender, age, race, ethnicity, um, and geographic information. Um, and the one real note that, that um, we'll say here is we know that data collection is always a challenging um, feat, um, but we do really encourage um, you to not have uh, stuff in the unknown categories. So if there's any way that you can um, try to collect that, that data and get a little bit clearer on that, um, that's um, really what we're going for and striving for. Um, and the one that's most important to us is um, on the income piece. Um, part of United Way's mission is serving people who are experiencing poverty, and so we want to make sure that our donors' um, dollars are being invested um, in those who are experiencing poverty. So I, this one I know in particular can be a challenge um, to programs, and so again, please connect with your program manager if you have questions about maybe how to collect that information. Um, we've got some ideas from different programs, and sometimes it works different strategies work um, better in different programs. Um, so again, we're looking, looking to try to decrease that number um, in the unknown category. Um, and then up here, um, this is just the number of households served. Um, and so that'll be different, I think, than the number of individuals. But for some of you, that, that number may be pretty close. <coughs> Um, and then the last piece of the annual report is the service delivery locations. And so what this is is you'll be filling in where services actually take place. So um, if I can use some examples of people in the room, PCYC, you just have one location, you're golden. Um, but Campfire, you're going to have multiple locations that you'll be filling out. Um, for some of you that have a lot of locations, um, I'm going to say maybe 25 or more. Um, you're, it's okay to submit a PDF um, to your program manager because um, otherwise you're just kind of adding another section here, typing it in, adding another section, typing it in. So we understand that that can be a little tedious. And so if you have a significant amount, um, you're just welcome to email that to your program manager. Any questions about anything that? Yes, Tom, can we get a microphone actually to Tom up here? I want to make sure the webinar folks hear your good question, Tom. Uh, In-kind is such a big part of ours and I'm sure everyone's programs. Is there a place to put that and account for that in this report? Yeah, good question. So I would probably, um, and I'll look to my colleagues too, maybe just add it in your the narrative piece. Um, Um, to kind of de describe and talk about it. Um, did you, do you have a number value that your organization puts on in kind? Yeah, I guess that would be the best place that I would say is just mention it in the, um, in the um, text box below. Yeah, good question. Other questions? This is not a question, but I'm just going to add um, something to what Rachel's been talking about. We're asking for a lot of numbers here, and it may be, feel a little bit dry and boring, but we actually use all of these data points as well, believe it or not. So many of our workforce, um, our workplace representatives and donor relations folks are having to crunch and shape numbers in different ways from everything that you report to then take it back into the donor community to say, this is the population that we're serving. This is how things are going. And so we do actually use all of this information in a lot of ways, including even all of your service locations. Um, we'll mm -hmm. often do uh, program mapping across the nine county region to see our just geographic distribution of where um, our investments are being made. So all of this is super helpful. And I just wanted to make one other plug for the storytelling piece, which I didn't get to share before. And I'm Sorry, I'm stealing your time. Go for it. Um, but the storytelling, if I wasn't clear before, it gets used also in so many different ways. And I think for those of you who we've reached out to for stories because of what you've shared in the annual reports, know this firsthand. Pictures on the wall, all of our brochures, 
um, our video, our campaign videos, and everything really comes from the stories that you tell through these annual reports. So I can't stress enough the importance of pretty much all of the information you're providing in these annual reports. So thank you. Good plug. Um, we have a question back here with Anne. Rachel, could you remind us um, for the income <clears throat> which of the categories applies to free reduced lunch qualification? Let me go back to that page here. So can you, um, sorry, so you scroll down? Household? Okay, thanks. So, um, so here, um, free and reduced lunch price is 185% um, of the federal poverty guidelines. So it actually fit in that middle column um, between 100 and 200%. Good question. So yeah, I, um, I know there are some programs too that uh, um, if you're operating with a school that has a certain percentage of free and reduced price lunch, um, you can extrapolate um, um, of those, the same percentage of those students that are um, also in your program too, if that makes sense. So if you don't have access to that information, um, that's another way to do it. So again, if you're struggling with that piece, um, your program manager can talk with you about what makes the most sense. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, great. Um, so these are just, bless you, some additional tips. Um, again, aim for accuracy and quality. Again, as Naomi said, um, our, our fundraisers are using um, the, these data points to um, raise funds in the community, and it really helps um, us understand the, the impact that you're making. And so um, really ask that you focus on, um, on accuracy and quality in these, quality, excuse me. Um, we did give you some extra time in, um, in the report. It's about two months now for you to fill out the report, and that's because August and September are kind of crazy times for education programs, and you're all doing different stuff. So, but we do encourage you to go in early um, just to kind of work out any technical issues or bugs. Um, we know everyone's a procrastinator pretty much, and so I know you're all going to be in there on September 29th filling it out. Um, but we don't want you to in, um, encounter any technical bugs or anything like that when you're kind of stressed out and getting that done. So just encourage you to go, go in early and make sure that um, everything's kind of working okay. And also, as Naomi said, you can access um, places on the link uh, for where your um, proposed goals, where your, where your old proposals are, your old annual reports and things like that. So you can see what you've um, submitted in the past, and that's really helpful to look at. Um, and again, I uh, just want to say it again, if you have questions, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to your program manager. Um, we're not here to uh, um, punitize or anything like that. We just want to understand and um, are really here to help you um, write the best report. So um, with that, um, I'm going to invite Tom up and he'll kind of run through actually how to enter the link and fill out the report. All right, good afternoon. My name is Tom Lance. I'm with our IT department here at Greater Twin Cities United Way. We're going to run through the kind of mechanics of how to actually get in, complete the report, things like that. Uh, okay, uh, real high level overview of the major steps that you guys are going to take to go through and complete these reports. Uh, well, before I do this, by show of hands, who will this be your first sort of trip through our online your application or grants reporting tool? Very few, a four or five. Good, lots of experience in the room, which is good. Um, high level steps, you know, step one, create your report team. Everyone who can contribute or who is going to be contributing to your report can have access to the online reporting. You can all contribute to the same thing. So no, you know, creating a Word document and sending it back and forth between four or five people, trying to remember what the latest version is. 
Um, if you set up your team well and plan your workout, everyone can go in and contribute to the same place so that you've got it all in one place. Um, so step two, then prepare your login. Uh, there is a little bit of a process to get um, through to actually have an account into the system. Um, there's a request form on our website that will show you how to get to. Once that comes in, it takes us, you know, sometimes we fill them in an hour, sometimes a couple hours, sometimes a couple days, depending upon how busy we are. But we need to set you up and tie you to the right account, to, to the right uh, organization, so you see the right reports, things like that. So there will be a process to get you access to the system. Then you go ahead and log in, you start your report, plug in all your information. Once when it's done, you're going to submit the completed report. So real high level steps right there. Uh, as far as preparing to log in, you know, we do list the best supported browsers. Um, every once in a while we run into some kind of goofy stuff with Google Chrome where like the print version of the application once you're done doesn't format very well in Google Chrome. Um, but for the most part any of these are going to work fine for 95% of what you're doing. Uh, we do use SharePoint and InfoPath which are Microsoft products so Internet Explorer is going to work best. They tend to integrate the best. All right, then on our website here, this is the link to the actual request a new uh, request a new account into the grants portal. Um, you go to that page. I think it's down a little bit. There's a big orange button that says request a new user account. If you have been in, um, you won't need to request a new account. If you don't remember your password, you go to the login page for the grants portal. There's going to be a link on there to get a new password. Um, you can automatically. Click the link, send it to yourself. You shouldn't need to contact us for that. Um, but for brand new people who have never been in either, you know, in the room or on your team, right to our website there to that link, request a new account. Uh, it, you will get an email back saying that it sometimes takes us two to three days depending upon how busy. And I can tell you that at the end of September, we're going to have these reports due. Uh, we have a payout for designated agencies that use a similar system that we'll be filling requests for. And we're coming up on a new round of funding. So there's going to be a lot of these requests coming in. Uh, if you wait until the 29th of September to, put, fill your, to plug your request in and it takes us two or three days to fill that, you're going to be sad. So get in early. Make sure you've got your access all set. All right, once you get your request submitted and it's filled, you'll get an email back from support at GTCUW. Look for that subject. Look for the username and password. Um, your username will just be your email address, but we'll just create a password for you the first time through. And it will send you to grantsproposal.unitedwaytwincities.org. You will get there, enter your username and password, and then it should get you in. So we're going to take an actual tour through the live site now. All right, here's the login page. Again, if you don't recall your username or password, uh, or especially your password, this forgot password is going to prompt you to key in your username, and it will send you a new password automatically. Otherwise, uh, see if I got it right. Uh, one other thing I'll point out, um, so this is going to take us to the landing sort of dashboard for the system, uh, which will display the grants, uh, the RFPs that have reports due. Um, on the info page on our website, there will also be information about the reports that are due in these education areas. That there will be links uh, to the proper pages within this system to get you to where you need to go. Go away. Okay. So I've hit my landing page. I have a test donor account here that's tied to, I believe, Boulder Options. Uh, what you should see, we don't currently have any open funding at the moment. That'll change shortly here in the fall. Uh, but under reporting subsites, you should see listed any of the areas that your organization is funded in that you have annual reports due. Uh, right now, that's just the three education areas, out of school, access, and uh, reading by third grade. Um, if you feel like you are funded in one of the areas and you're not Seeing the link there, let us know. We can double check it. And as far as letting us know, I'll scroll over here a little bit on the right. We do have a few United Way staff contacts, Melanie Dennis, uh, Katie Jurek. Technical support for questions about how to actually use the site um, is going to be you know, your best bet if you don't see a report listed there that you, uh, that you think you should be completing. Um, again, 
this is just those report those areas that have annual reports due. So if you receive funding in a you know in um, I don't know a food shelf program that your organization has, there's no reports due in that area. You're not going to see the link there. You still have access to it. We can get you to that area, but these are just the areas that have reports due. So from here, I'm going to go ahead and hit the out of school time link. I'm each uh, rough funding area has their own subpage here, so we've got to the fund funding uh, area subpage. There's some details about the uh, about the information about the RFP, who the program manager is, who to contact in operations, things like that, and a quick little announcement about annual reports, which are going on now. Once you get to this page, um, you'll see at this point there's nothing in the 2014 annual report library. Uh, we do have an annual report for 2013 from Boulder Options, so you will see your organization's uh, reports from last year and 2012 if you had one. Um, one time, the first time you come in and you're ready to start a new report, you'll create a new document. From there, it's going to save in the library and you'll just go into the uh, document you've started. So one time, we're going to start a new report. The very first thing I would recommend you do is give your report a name, select your organization, and then go ahead and save it. So. Uh, we'll do IT test and choose my organization from the list. As Naomi mentioned, we've had some times where people select that and then they want to page down through the form, page down, they are flipping through the different things. So make sure that you select your organization, click out, um, and then I would go ahead and click save. You'll get a message confirming your report's been saved once you've gotten through it. What we do run into occasionally uh, there is a limit on this field. It's not great the way that Microsoft set it up, but um, we truncate in some information like your organization's name and the date that it was submitted. And sometimes people put big long titles in there and it just gets too long. Uh, you try and save, you'll get a goofy error message, um, and then uh, it just doesn't work well. We end up having to close out the form and start over. So what we don't want to happen is the first time through we put in a really long name, we fill in a bunch of information, try and save it, it doesn't save, we could lose some data. So. Make sure once through, you put in that name, save it, it's good. You won't run into any other troubles from there on out. Make sense? So name it, save it, then we can go back in. We're still in the document. Then we can go through and actually start plugging in information. Uh, now you only ran through a lot of the specific details of the form. Um, just a couple things I will point out. We do have um, kind of an informational page on the budget and demographics section that you can access. Uh, let me go back to the report. So under organizational budget, you would see the same thing under demographics. There is this click here for more information. Similar to what Naomi ran through where we've got comments and tips on what to plug in in certain areas, uh, same type of information that we've got here. So if you need more information on what exactly you're filling in, uh, that might be helpful to you. Otherwise, uh, we did, she made a comment about the other boxes there uh, that if you are providing information uh, on a budget item for other, uh, that you give us a description. The form is actually set up that if I fill in $100 here, it's going to make that description field required. So if you do use the other, you're going to be required to fill in a description for it. Um, we've got save buttons throughout the, way, uh, throughout the form. We do recommend that you know periodically as you're going through, make sure you're saving your information so that you know this is accessed through a browser. Browsers freeze, crash, your internet connection could drop. You don't want to lose a whole bunch of information. So periodically, make sure you're saving. Uh, aside from that, service delivery locations uh, should be pretty straightforward. Fill out the information for one. Click down here to add another address. It's going to add another section, and we can keep adding. Again, I'm going to save as I go along. Once everything is done at the very end, one time we are going to submit. After you submit the report, you won't have access to make changes anymore. So be sure you're, you're done done before you hit that submit button. Uh, a lot of people ask for printer-friendly versions of their reports. Um, you can hit print on this. It'll come out onto a paper. Uh, on, on the paper. It doesn't look great. There is uh, a more optimized print version that you can get to by clicking the print preview link up on the top. This is size it up a little bit better to fit. Uh, the one thing that doesn't work real well always, and it's just the way Microsoft designed the product, 
if you get text boxes that are really long, if a single text box over overflows a page, it could cut off. Um, you know, for the sake of the people who have to read the reports and applications, we ask for brevity in the answers. But if for some reason you do need to provide a long answer, you need a printed copy of it that's not uh, that's not working. Email the support desk, and we can help with that. But for the most part, uh, it should print out fine. Uh, once we have saved the document, I'm going to close out. It's going to show me the library of documents that I have, or if I'm back on the main page, we can see here's that IP report test created on August 7th at 2.45. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can either come back in, you'll see that document, and you can click right into it to access it again to make changes. Um, or other folks in your organization on your team can go in and make changes to that as well, add additional information, things like that. Um, questions on anything so far? Pretty straightforward. Let's flip back then to start from here. OK, uh, a few tips, tips. A lot of these I've covered. Again, save as you go. We don't want to lose information if your session freezes. Um, you can copy and paste from Word. That's fine if you want to do that. The one thing I'll point out is that if you have fancy formatting, bullet points, things like that, not all of that is going to come across. So um, they're a little bit more straightforward, plain text boxes. So don't put any fancy charts and things like that and look for them to come across into the online form. Um, we say use the scroll bar to move through the application because of the issue of people arrow keying through and changing which uh, report if that box is selected, which organization they are a part of. Um, I'm going to go into an example of this, but any person for your organization who is registered um, can work in the same application. Uh, but we don't recommend multiple staff working at the same time because you're not going to see each other's changes. And we've had issues in the past where I save my changes, someone else saves their changes, and they overwrite things that I plugged in. Uh, and I'll show you an example of what, uh, of what that could look like. Um, and then to that point, when you're done with your changes, we recommend you close out so that other folks at your organization, if they happen to be uh, multiple people working in it, um, can come in later and make changes as well. So just a fancy diagram you know, showing what it could, you know, how uh, you could end up with other people overwriting your work. So in this case, Susan opens up a brand new report at 807, or let's say she saves a new copy at 807. Then she works on it for 20 minutes or so and comes back at 824 and saves with, let's say, two narrative boxes filled in up at the top. Uh, in between there, Carl opened up the application and filled out some information in the budgeting section. And he saved his copy at 838. Carl's copy is all that's going to be saved. So those narrative questions that Susan saved at 824, they get overwritten. And it's just Carl doesn't see the information that Susan puts in. All that we're going to see is the information he plugged in. So uh, we talked a little bit about planning out your team. We also suggest you kind of plan out a schedule and maybe have one person who's the point person to put information in. Or just make sure you're clear on who's entering information when so you're not all in there at the same time. Oops. Uh, and then as far as submitting a report, you know, scan through, make sure all your fields are uh, completed, um, make sure that your internal reviews are done, that your executive director approves, program staff have seen it if they need to. You'll click that Submit button once, and then on the, uh, on the dashboard, the library where it lists your document, it should have a field uh, saying that the status is submitted. So um, if, it, you know, if it's in there, we have the information, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but it's a good check to make sure that you have told us that this is submitted and final. And then resources, uh, as far as filling out the report. Uh, emails are going to go out. There will be information for you guys on, the, on what you're plugging into the reporting subsite. Um, also, on our website, the online instructions for reporting is going to have information on uh, what goes in, how to get to the reporting subsites, things like that. Uh, service level agreement for technical assistance, or we have our email to the help desk um, there are a few of us who manage those calls, so uh, direct your uh, initial questions there, and we'll read out if, uh, if necessary. We also have a help desk phone number as well for other questions. Any other questions? Any questions at all on, uh, on doing this, or people have been through it a few times and it's pretty old hat by now?
Silence is good. Thank you. You probably want this. So that really ends the, the portion of our group session. So we're actually going to say um, thank you and goodbye to folks webinar for joining us. Um, now we'll have an opportunity to um,